As someone who is lucky enough to live in the golden age of beer here in the United States, it's interesting to watch craft beer culture here evolve. In Germany, for example, there are many regions each brewing their own distinct styles of traditional beers out of a comparatively limited set of ingredients. And we're starting to see that fragmentation here in the United States, too. Take a West Coast versus a New England IPA, for example. What I want to know as a beer nerd and amateur historian is after many years, what do you think the regionality of the US beer scene is going to look like? And I think one of the best ways to think about this question is by looking at one of the other great beer regions in the world, German regional beer styles, and in particular, the Kolsch. Hey, this is Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and every once in a while I need a beer that doesn't try to wow me with some flashy ingredients or crazy brewing techniques, but instead is just incredibly balanced and easy drinking. And for me, my favorite easy drinking beer style is a classic Kolsch. Kolsch is the regional beer from Cologne, Germany, and like almost every German beer style, it has a rich tradition, along with some cool politics and stories thrown in. So let's take a deeper look at this classic ale today on Beer by the Numbers. And if you're excited for some beer history, be sure to leave a like down below as we go on a trip to get some great beer. American craft brewers like to think of themselves as a fiercely independent bunch. Hell, they have a seal they stick on their packages to prove it. But I would argue that the Kolsch captures the true spirit of independence much, much better as a beer. In a country full of great lagers and strongly flavored ales, Kolsch stands defiantly, being the only traditional pale barley ale in Germany. Even its brewing technique is unusual. The beer is warm fermented using traditional ale yeast, a very traditional start to this beer, but then it's cold conditioned like a new age lager. This gives the beer a crystal clear appearance and a perfectly balanced taste featuring both the great barley malts and delicious noble German hops. Such a unique brand of beer could only come from the city of Cologne, a community that weathered over a thousand years of outside invasions, oppressive rulers, and all out war. Cologne is a city in the western German state of North Rhine-Westphalia and was founded as a Roman fort and trading post in the year 38 BC. The name translates roughly to colony, which gives you some insights as to what the Romans were thinking at the time. And it's no wonder that they chose this particular spot. It is right on the Rhine River, which was busy with trade and sits about halfway between Munich and London, two important cities in the Greater Roman Empire. The thriving trade and industry in Cologne made it the de facto capital of the Rhineland when the Roman Empire fell in the 5th century, and as such, you can bet it had a thriving brewing industry. For nearly a thousand years, the monastic brewers controlled beer production in Cologne and churned out great traditional Gruet-based ales. But while the power of the church was beginning to decline in Germany by the year 1400, new secular brewers began popping up and they were looking for a bit of a change. You see, up in the north of Germany, a new style of ale infused with hops rather than Gruet spice mixture was becoming incredibly popular. It was called, and pardon my poor German pronunciation, Kütebier, and the secular brewers were quick to adopt the style when they got wind of it in Cologne. The church wasn't particularly happy with these secular brewers breaking the brewing tradition. And while they didn't ban the production of Qt beer outright, they didn't allow brewers who made it to join the local brewing guild. As we all know today, hopped beers are superior to Gruet ales in many ways, so predictably Qt beer became really, really popular. So much so that the brewers of Qt beer were eventually admitted into the guild, and the traditional church brewers even made the switch. In less than a hundred years, Gruet beers were outlawed altogether in 1495, and the age of the hop in Cologne had begun. At the same time Gruet beers were being outlawed, lagered beers were beginning to become popular in the more mountainous brewing regions across Europe. Now you might think the new, more progressive Brewers Guild in Cologne would love to adopt these fancy new lagering techniques, but there's something you need to understand about these old European Brewers Guilds. 
Today we think of the Brewers Guild here in the United States as much more of an advocacy and marketing group, but back in the age of limited technology and health regulations, guilds acted much more as quality control groups. They were responsible for maintaining the quality and reputation of beer as a safe and delicious beverage more than anything. So subpar beer was absolutely unacceptable to the guild in an age without health inspectors. And while the brewers of Cologne might have liked to try lagering their beers, it was much harder to cold condition beers in the warmer Rhineland region of Germany than the more cold and hilly southeast. In order to protect the reputation of quality beer in Cologne, bottom fermenting beers, or using lager yeast, was outlawed in 1603. So up until the 19th century, beers from Cologne had more in common with traditional alt beers, the brown and dark ales, rather than the modern Kolsch that dominates their brewing scene today. But one invention would change all that. In 1818, the indirect heat kiln was invented, and this allowed maltsters to dry and color malt in a much greater range than before. Suddenly, pale malts were all the rage across Europe, and with the Pilsner being first brewed around the 1840s in Bohemia, it became clear that light-colored, crystal-clear lager beers were the next big thing in European brewing. But because lagering beer was still illegal in Cologne, the local brewers faced a bit of a problem. How are they going to meet the increased demand for lighter, clearer beers without resorting to lagering yeast? Luckily, early refrigeration technology was becoming available, so the creative brewers of Cologne had an idea. What if they made a delicious traditional Weiss beer ale, you know, a nice German pale colored ale, and then cold conditioned it like a lager? Well, this clever solution to avoid a centuries old brewing law made something fantastic. A beer that still has a strong, pale malt flavor of a Weiss beer, but with the clarity and lighter mouthfeel of a lager. Until the late 1800s, the word Kolsch didn't mean a particular style of beer, but was an adjective to describe something from Cologne. But by the year 1900, the new style of beer was so delicious and popular that the word Kolsch became synonymous with the famous beer. But just as the beer was beginning to establish an identity in the rich world of German beer, the brewers of Cologne faced their greatest challenge yet. World War I led to severe grain rationing, and many brewers did not survive the quotas and severe taxation that followed the war. And World War II would deal an even greater blow. Cologne, being along Germany's western front, was leveled by bombs. It lost 90% of its population and took most of its brewery workers as soldiers. By 1946, there were only three breweries left standing in this once powerful center of commerce. But Coloners faced this adversity head on. Within a decade, they were back to 20 operating breweries and reformed the Brewers Guild with roughly the same membership as the city saw when the first guild formed 650 years prior. And just like the medieval guild, the brewers were looking to restore a distinctly Kolsch beer culture. Let's pause for just a moment and talk about the beer itself. A Kolsch is light gold, almost sun bleached in color. It has a high degree of clarity with a fluffy, low to medium white head that might always not stick around very long. The aroma will be that of delicate fruit esters produced by the yeast with a little bit of malt in the background. A little bit of hops on the nose is acceptable, but is not too common in the style. The beer should have a medium light body with a healthy bit of carbonation. With a low residual sweetness, it should feel crisp across the palate. Finally, the flavor should be clean and taste of highly attenuated malts with a hint of bitterness. All in all, it's one of my favorite styles of beers, precisely because of how simple yet refreshing it is. Now, the brew pubs in Cologne have established a very particular way in which traditional colches are to be served. Waiters, known as cobes, dress in a uniform of a blue shirt or jacket and a leather apron, and come bearing 7-ounce glasses of colch in a circular tray known as a colchenkranz or colch wreath. The cylindrical glass, known as a stang, translates roughly to pole and ensures that the appetizing beer will never warm up too much and that all the cobes will always be busy serving the smaller glasses. The standing area is known as the schwem or swimming pool, 
because of the brisk, hectic interaction between the patrons and the agile Kolbs. Serving beer this way not only helps the beer stay cold as intended, but creates a lot of fun interactions between patrons and staff. With the increasing popularity of session beers and a great amount of tradition behind it, Kolsch is becoming a very popular style with American craft brewers. It's often considered a summer seasonal here in the United States, but if you're lucky like me, you'll have a brewery nearby who makes one year round like they do in Cologne. One final thing I want to share with you about this great style that you might not know. There are several distinct sub-styles of Kolsch that are out there today. Gothel Kolsch is, showcases more hops than the standard style, adding complex aromas to the minimalist template. Fir Kolsch has the most yeast character, adding a great yeasty aroma reminiscent of Belgian brews. Restorf Kolsches are what you'd most commonly find here in the US and have a great balance of all elements with a slight bit of sweetness. Finally, Double Mountain Kolsch adds a little extra alcohol for a drier finish and sometimes uses a pinch of black pepper for a slightly spicy note on the back of the taste. Kolsch is a style that was born out of great brewing traditions trying to keep up with an ever-changing world. Looking at this style has made me really excited about one of my favorite beers, and it's also given me something to look forward to here in the U.S. beer scene. As the U.S. develops its own strong beer culture, it'll be interesting to see how certain regions mix traditions with the constant change we've all come to expect. I'll tell you one thing though, I'll be there with a delicious and easy drinking Kolsch, watching it all unfold. Have you ever had a Kolsch? If so, let me know what you think down in the comments section below. And while you're down there, check out the link in the description to the Beer by the Numbers Facebook groups. Lots of great beer discussion going on over there. Once again, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll be back next week with more traditional beer content.